This Week at NASA. Space Shuttle Atlantis remains on track for July 8th launch. The four-person crew of STS-135, Commander Chris Ferguson, Pilot Doug Hurley, Mission Specialists Rex Walheim and Sandy Magnus, continues preparations for the final flight of NASA's Space Shuttle program. To ready for the work they'll do on the International Space Station, the crew trained in the Neutral Buoyancy Lab at Johnson Space Center and the Kennedy Space Center's Orbiter Processing Facility. Atlantis will carry the Raffaello Multipurpose Logistics Module with about 17,000 pounds of supplies and spare parts to the ISS. Largely it's a cargo mission. Uh, it's a, an effort to posture the space station for uh, about a year, uh, put it in a good position until we can get our uh, commercial uh, cargo resupply system up and running. Atlantis sits at the ready on launch pad 39A after its external tank passed a pre-launch liquid propellant test. This is the first time we really are pinpointing when these black holes were really forming and growing. NASA's Science Mission Directorate conducted two news conferences to update the media on progress and developments well, in the Chandra X-ray Observatory and that, uh, Messenger uh, missions. So. The first of the two provided a look at new pictures and data collected by Chandra. It took the research that was done over the last decade with Chandra uh, for people to begin to realize that you could by observing very deeply in the universe that you could piece together some of the very early history of black hole growth. Black holes are the last evolutionary stage in the lifetimes of stars that were once at least 10 to 15 times as massive as our own sun. These cold remnants are extremely dense, exerting a gravitational pull so strong that nothing, not even light, can escape their grasp. Uh, in many cases, a lot of the original ideas about Mercury are just plain wrong, and so we're finding some surprises. Also revealed, new images and science findings from the first spacecraft to orbit Mercury. We've gotten some very good fluorescent X-ray data from the surface, so we're getting good measurements right now of the average composition of key elements like magnesium, aluminum, silicon, sulfur, calcium, titanium, and iron with this instrument. NASA's Mercury Surface Space Environment Geochemistry and Ranging, or MESSENGER spacecraft, completed more than a dozen laps through the inner solar system during the six years prior to achieving the historic orbit insertion on March 17th. Mercury really is a world in and of its own, and we're finding that um, just like the Earth, it's got its own personality. Uh, Mercury is one of the terrestrial planets and therefore provides some context for what was going on in the inner part of the solar system back when the, the planets were condensing from the solar nebula. MESSENGER will image, in stereo, nearly the entire surface of Mercury to determine the planet's global topography and landforms. This video of the giant asteroid Vesta was created by scientists working with NASA's Dawn spacecraft, highlighting Vesta's jagged, irregular shape. The video loops 20 images Dawn captured for navigation purposes as it approached this unexplored world in the main asteroid belt. A dark feature near Vesta's equator moves from left to right with the asteroid's rotation, hinting at the enormous crater known to exist at Vesta's south pole. Dawn is scheduled to begin orbiting the asteroid on July 16th. <laughs> Graduates of NASA's Systems Engineering Leadership Development Program received their diplomas at a ceremony held at headquarters. SELDP accelerates and develops the leadership potential of mid-level systems engineers to help them better deal with difficult and multifaceted technical problems and intricate social systems. The process of their uh, learning experience over the year, learning a lot about themselves and, uh, and how they can do a better job of, uh, of leading teams and practicing both the art and the science of uh, system engineering. There was 20 of us in um, SELDP and uh, each of us came from different centers so there was a lot of mingling of ideas and, and cultures um, and I think we all grew from this. The year-long program was initiated in 2008 to ensure that NASA's workforce would be ready and able to lead the world in space exploration, scientific discovery, technology development, and managerial excellence. So we're quite excited about uh, what these folks have done and very, very excited about what they're going to do in their, in their future at NASA.
In an ear-deafening twist of irony, this supersonic aircraft is producing amped up, super loud sonic booms to help make our skies quieter. NASA researchers at the Dryden Flight Research Center laid out a two mile long string of microphones to record the thunder of an accelerating FA-18 jet for the Superboom Caustic Analysis and Measurement Program, or SCAMP. SCAMP measured these focus booms to understand how to minimize their startling impact and ensure that tomorrow's supersonic jets will be quiet in all phases of flight over land, including acceleration. Glenn Research Center employees and visitors will soon be checking in through a new main entrance. The new single-story 2,500 square foot structure, main gate, and its roadway, called the NASA Parkway, will mark a milestone in a 20-year master plan to improve facilities and infrastructure at Glenn's Lewis Field in Cleveland and the Plum Brook Station in Sandusky, Ohio. The event was celebrated with a special ribbon cutting ceremony. It really isolates the processing of our visitors, uh, keeps them outside the security barrier, helps our security guards with the traffic flow in and out of the center. The new building will be gold certified as a high performance, eco friendly building by the U.S. Green Building Council Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, or LEAD. The Ames Research Center's sustainability base has been named the government's Green Building of the Year. Due to be completed later this summer, the structure incorporates technology used by astronauts in space and will be one of only a few buildings in California generating more electricity than it consumes. Construction for sustainability base has been more expensive than a standard government facility but NASA expects its lower operating costs will offset the extra expense within 10 years. NASA 360, the TV program that highlights how NASA technology contributes to our daily lives, was nominated for a National Daytime Emmy Award for single camera television editing. Today, NASA is in the process of testing NASA 360 is based at the Langley Research Center and, and is course, produced for NASA by the National lab. Institute of but Aerospace. Yes. Besides NASA TV, the half hour program is seen on select airlines, cable, free to air broadcast channels, and 450 public broadcasting service stations across the country. And now, centerpieces. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to JPL Tweet Up 2011. Thank you for coming. <laughs> In the world of social media, a tweet up is a meetup. Twitter users, bloggers, and other social media fans. Uh, my Twitter handle is at Yugluk, Neo Teotihuacan. I tweet in the pillow note. A NASA tweet up draws a special crowd. <laughs> I'm a science geek, it's, it's, I'm, not, I'm not ashamed. <laughs> These space tweeps got to rub elbows with NASA scientists and engineers. The ion thruster pushes on the spacecraft as hard as this piece of paper pushes on my hand. And met legends like John Cassani, who worked on the Cassini, Voyager, and Galileo missions. It's so rewarding to all of us to see people like you who are excited and turned on by the products of what comes out of here and get that message out to the people who support us. Sitting there every once in a while you're going, I can't believe that people do this, that we send things millions of miles out into space. Uh, it's, it's just incredible to, to be able to get it from the people who are actually doing it. This tweet up drew more than 100 tweets from 20 states and two foreign countries. It impresses me how much the entire NASA staff is dedicated to outreach, especially the way that NASA works with kids and creating new geeks and new scientists. They blogged, they tweeted, telling their followers everything. Ready? Good. Having their pictures taken in 3D, seeing Mission Control, home of the Deep Space Network, the Mars rover testbed, and Curiosity, 
It's actually kind of sad because every time I come up here, it's like one of the last times I'm going to be able to look at it. And then it goes to Florida for a few more months, and then November, the day after Thanksgiving, is our is the opening of our launch window. How has this space geek been enjoying this? I am in heaven. This is my idea of summer camp. It was a space exploration love fest. There's almost too much great stuff here to do in a single day. We're all very, very tired, but very, very happy geeks. It's called Star Trek The Exhibition, and it's attracting both diehard fans and novices to the Kennedy Space Center's visitor complex like a Klingon to intergalactic mayhem. The interactive exhibit showcases authentic Star Trek artifacts from the past 45 years, including one-of-a-kind costumes, props and displays from the popular 60s television show, and subsequent feature films. Visitors are treated to a recreation of the original series Starship Enterprise Bridge with a chance to occupy the command chair of Captain James Tiberius Kirk. Also on hand are replicas of the engineering and sick bays from Star Trek The Next Generation. Star Trek The Exhibition also features interactive kiosks and rare photo opportunities. And that's This Week at NASA. For more on these and other stories, log on to www.nasa.gov.